Chapter 6 of Sermons of a Buddhist Abbot This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Gavola Sermons of a Buddhist Abbot by Soyan Shaku Translated by Daisets Teitaro Suzuki Chapter 6 Buddhist Ethics Pai Lutian, a famous Chinese poet, author, and statesman who lived in the 13th century of the Christian era, once went to see an eminent Buddhist monk whose saintly life was known far and near, and asked him if he would instruct him in the essentials of Buddhist doctrine. The monk assented and recited the following gatha. Quote, Commit no wrong, but good deeds do and let thy heart be pure. All Buddhas teach this truth, which will for I endure. Unquote. The statesman poet was not at all satisfied with this simple moral teaching, for he expected to have something abstruse, recondite, and highly philosophical from the mouth of such a prominent and virtuous personality. Said the poet, Every child is familiar with this Buddhist injunction. What I wish to learn from you is the highest and most fundamental teaching of your faith. But the monk retorted, Every child may know of this gatha, but even a silvery-haired man fails to put it into practice. Thereupon, it is said, the poet reverentially bowed and went home meditatively. If we are requested today to state what is the most fundamental in Buddhist ethics, we have to make the same assertion. There may be, and in fact are, many schools and denominations in Buddhism, each claiming to have transmitted the true spirit of Buddha. But they will be unanimous in declaring that the gatha aforementioned is one of the common grounds on which they all stand Saba Papasa Akaranam is heard in all southern monasteries, and the lines Chu Wo Mo Tso, etc., are seen everywhere in the eastern lands of Buddhism. If Buddhism were called a sort of ethical culture society on account of this simple code of morality, its followers would make no objection to it, for the recognition of a personal god or the conception of original sin, or belief in a risen Christ, is not thought indispensable to Buddhist salvation. Let a man do what is good, and avoid what is bad, and have his heart as pure as he can of all egotistic impulses and desires, and he will be delivered from the clutches of ignorance and misery. Whatever his dogmatic views on religion, he is one of the enlightened who are above bigotry intolerance, vanity, conceit, pedantry, and prejudice. He must truly be said to be one whose spiritual insight has penetrated into the depths of existence. Now the question is, what is good? What is evil? And how is the heart to be cleansed? I am not going to discuss here these great ethical and religious problems from a mere theoretical point of view, Buddhism has nothing to do with utilitarianism or intuitionalism or hedonism or what not. Buddhism is most practical in its announcement of what constitutes goodness. It dogmatically and concretely points out good deeds one by one. First, negatively, it enumerates ten deeds of goodness, kusalam, as most fundamental in Buddhist ethics while positively it considers the six paramitas, virtues of perfection, or eightfold path, as the route leading to a virtuous life. The ten deeds of goodness are 1. Not to kill any living being. 2. Not to take anything that does not belong to oneself. 3. Not to look at the other sex with an unclean heart. 4. Not to speak falsehood. 5. 
not to calumniate. 6. Not to use vile language. 7. Not to make sensational utterances. 8. Not to be greedy. 9. Not to be out of temper. And lastly, 10. Not to be confused by false doctrines. Later Buddhists, however, make ten affirmative propositions out of those just mentioned. Thus, it is good, one, to save any living being, two, to practice charity, three, to be clean-minded, four, to speak truth, five, to promote friendship, six, to talk softly and gently, seven, to be straightforward in speech, eight, to be content with one's own possessions, nine, to be meek and humble, and ten, to think clearly and rightly. The six paramitas or virtues of perfection are, one, charity, which includes the giving away of worldly possessions as well as the proclamation of the good law. Two, the observation of the moral precepts, as formulated by Buddha. Three, meekness. Four, strenuosity. Five, contemplation. Six, spiritual enlightenment. The Eightfold Path is one, right view, two, right reflection, three, right speech, four, right deed, five, right livelihood, six, right striving, seven, right understanding, eight, right contemplation. In these various enumerations of Buddhist virtues, what is most unique are perhaps the virtues of strenuosity and those of contemplation and enlightenment. To be good Buddhists, we must never be indolent, whiling away our time to no purpose. Mere piety will not do, so long as there is some work to be accomplished for the sake of humanity and civilization. Love, again, must be accompanied with enlightenment, for the affection is very frequently wasted on account of its blindness. God-fearing is recommendable, but without contemplation we fail to recognize the purport of our own position in the system of the universe. Mere passion leads to fervor and violence if not properly guided by contemplation, which brings enlightenment, revealing the reason of existence and purifying the heart of ignorance. Ignorance, according to Buddhism, is the root of all evil, and therefore it advises us in strong terms to have ignorance completely destroyed. And it is only then that the all-illuminating light of enlightenment guides us gloriously to the destination of all beings, where we gain purity of heart and whatever flows from this eternal fountain of purity is good. It is evident, then, that by purity of heart is meant absence of ignorance and self-will. But it is not a negative condition. For the most essential postulate of Buddhism is that in each of us there abideth the indwelling reason of the universe, which, when released from the temporal bondage of ignorance and self-will, becomes the master of itself, by reducing everything to subjection and restoring it to its right place. In a pure heart, therefore, the universal reason manifests itself in its full glory and works its own destiny unmolested. What one with such a heart wills is what makes the bird sing and the flower smile, what has raised the mountain and makes the water flow. He is hungry, and the universe wishes to eat. He is asleep, and all the world hibernates. This sounds extraordinary, but the enlightened understand it perfectly well. We cannot make the blind see what we ourselves see. 
The blind may protest that we are deceiving them, but could we do otherwise, inasmuch as they are deprived of the sense we have, or they have not yet learned how to make use of it? It is declared by Buddhists, therefore, that to realize fully the sanctity of religious life, one must have Buddha wisdom awakened from its unconscious slumber, in which it is indulging from time out of mind. Analytically, purity of heart consists of sympathy and intelligence, and on this groundwork the structure of practical Buddhism is founded. Sympathy is the tremulation of the spiritual cord which unites the hearts of all sentient beings, and it is intelligence that discovers the presence of the sacred cord in every one of us and keeps it from being entangled. The cord freely responds to cries of suffering. The heart contrives to effect all the possible means to relieve sentient beings from misery and ignorance. The Ten Deeds of Goodness, the Eightfold Path, the Six Virtues of Perfection, and many other good things all flow from this one source of pure-heartedness. It is then of unqualified importance in the ethics of Buddhism to have one's heart perfectly cleansed and free from the dust of egotism which has been accumulating through the want of enlightenment. In this sense, blessed are the pure in heart. They may not see God as he is superficially and superstitiously understood, but they will surely come into personal touch with the ultimate authority of conduct and also perceive that the author is not residing outside of their being, but within themselves. We read in the Dharmapada, Mano Pubangama Dhamma, Mano Setta, Mano Maya. Manasa se Parutana Basati Va Karoti Va. Tato Nam Dukaman Veti, Kakara Va Vahato Padam. Mano Pubangama Dhamma, Mano Setta, Mano Maya. Manasa se pasanena basati va karoti va. Tato nam sukara anveti. Chaya va anapayini. Footnote translation. All that is, is the result of thought. It is founded on thought. It is made of thought. If a man speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain follows him as the wheel follows the foot of the ox that draws the carriage. All that is, is the result of thought. It is founded on thought. It is made of thought. If a man speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness follows him, like a shadow that never leaves him. End footnote. In this respect, Buddhism can be said to have a decidedly idealistic tendency since it fully recognizes the paramountcy of ideas in the moral realm. But we must not lose sight of the fact that Buddhism is not a system of metaphysics, but a religion which is practical more than anything else. What it teaches is the profound spiritual experience of every enlightened man, while the philosopher and theorist will speculate on the facts and offer whatever interpretation they may please or feel compelled to give to account adequately for them. Buddhism is often charged with passiveness and quietism, lacking the push of some other religions, and the backwardness of Asiatic nations in the general march of humanity is sometimes ascribed to the influence of Buddhism. Though I am not here entering upon any lengthy polemics, a few words may not be altogether inopportune to refute such an erroneous opinion as this. If there is anything passive in Eastern culture, which is often no more than tolerance or indifference or self-restraint, it is not due to Buddhism, but to the racial idiosyncrasy of Asiatic peoples. Buddhism teaches contemplation and tranquility, and at the same time strenuosity, 
indefatigable energy in following truth and in destroying ignorance. We see many admirable examples among its believers who have fully illustrated these virtues in their person. The history of Buddhism, while perfectly free from bloodshed and inhumanity, evidences how far its moral teachings have been carried out. Buddhist ethics is not certainly passive or negative, unless the absence of arrogance, aggressiveness, intolerance, bigotry, and fanaticism could be called so. Religion in its social aspect is not omnipotent, nor is it absolute, as is imagined by some. It is, like many other things created by man, a human institution. It has been discovered, shaped, developed according to the inner necessity of mankind, and as long as he is imperfect and steering his course through innumerable obstacles, religion also must share his imperfection and adapt itself to ever-changing surroundings. Instead of imposing its ideals upon man tyrannically and absolutely, religion reconciles itself to his needs, going through all the necessary modifications. Therefore, one religion is diversely interpreted by different peoples among whom it may thrive. To suppose that religion could do anything it desires without regard to individual, national, racial peculiarities is far from the fact. The difference between Oriental and Occidental civilization is by no means due to the difference between Christianity and Buddhism. On the other hand, the difference between the two religions is due to the difference between the two great types of civilization. Truth, be it religious or philosophical or scientific, is universal, and as such, does not allow any modification or distortion. But it suffers modification in its practical application, for it is like a mathematical formula or figure. When conceived a priori, it is formal and not subject to any concrete individualization, which latter, in fact, is the condition of its particular forms. In conclusion, let me say most emphatically that the ethics of Buddhism is summed up in the purification of the heart, in keeping oneself unspotted even though living in the world. And from this eternal root must sprout such things of God as love, a heart of compassion, the virtue of strenuosity, humbleness of mind, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, and freedom from all evils. It is said that there were 84,000 virtues of perfection practiced by all bodhisattvas, but they are no more than so many leaves and branches growing from the one stem of pure-heartedness. End of chapter 6 Recording by William Gavulla.